Glory to Jesus Christ, and welcome back to Becoming Byzantine. In this session, we will continue looking at the faith of the church, and we'll focus especially on what we call the ancestral fall, and we'll look at the end uh, at the promise of the Messiah. So, a recap. God created everything freely and good. So what happens is, the Holy Scripture tells us that evil is something that appears later on. Evil is not something that was equal to good as though it is you know, sort of cosmic battle in heaven um, through, you know, after which God, good prevails over evil. No, evil appears as a result of the rejection of something good. And what does that mean? Well, as I, as I mentioned last time, uh, philosophically, many of the the saints, the thinkers of the church, talk about how evil is not a reality in the same way that good is. Now, of course, it's, you know, it exists in the world, but it doesn't have the same philosophically that the existence uh, that, that good does, uh, because it, it's a negation of the good. Only good truly exists because God is good. Yeah. Everything that he creates comes from him. Evil is a rejection of that. That means God doesn't make anything that was evil. Evil is what's a limitation. It's a corruption of what is good and, and truly exists in the mind of God. Evil is non-being. Right? Sin is a negation, a failure to be what God wants us to be. And that comes about as a consequence of the fall. The fall through which evil enters into the world and the fall which was allowed by God, permitted by God for the sake of, 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 of something else, really our repentance and our conversion later on. So God would use what was evil um, in order to help us. That again proves that his goodness is far more powerful. So what was the fall? Now, of course, we're looking at the book of Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, we see Adam and Eve being tempted by the serpent. The serpent proposed what was basically a false idea of human destiny to humans. Okay, that the serpent suggested that humanity would become like God. And here's the thing, without following God's directions for them. So by means of their own efforts, proposing that human goodness doesn't come from God, but comes from within ourselves. And so we attain a divine status, but without the real divine being, God, being involved in that. So the tempter, the serpent, draws the human person into a dialogue with him. Draw, because, you see, that's how sin starts. Sin starts with a dialogue, a dialogue which causes the person to doubt something or to be afraid of something or possibly to think of doing something else other than what they set themselves to do. And that gives birth to doubt. And that gives birth to doubt, especially about who God is and what God has, has said. So God says, do not eat of the fruit of this particular tree. The dialogue with the evil happens. And through that dialogue, the human person begins to doubt, you know, perhaps God's way, God's intended way of doing something, you know, it's not, it's not so good after all. So maybe I'll do something else. And it's that way, it's in that way that the human person was deceived. And the human person was deceived um, uh, based on the premise that God deceived us. See how, see how evil did that? You know, God deceived us. Therefore, we, we are deceived in that deception. It's the great, de greatest deception. And through that, you know, our freedom was undercut. Our freedom was undercut because we chose what led us into slavery as opposed to what made us truly free. Okay? We thought that we could become like God without God. Now, with the eating of that, you know, the forbidden fruit, what happens is that illusion all vanished. Evil emerges and emptiness emerges. It was like, you know, when we commit something, uh, when we do something we know we shouldn't do. Our conscience tells us we shouldn't have done that. 
there was some sort of emptiness there because again, we were not designed to be satisfied ultimately with anything other than God. St. John Chrysostom describes the human person in that state as like a corpse, a corpse that, that, that's devoid of energy and uh, uh, devoid of spiritual energy that is. And that's what makes us feel dead. And as a consequence of that fall, we lose the state of paradise, the Garden of Eden. And the sin of our first parents becomes you know, stamped in the world because it's such a cosmic fall away from divine grace. And the sadness after that fall is that we couldn't return to God in any other way except by God's help. You know, God helped us by bringing us into existence, if you will, and because we fell away from that, that state of communion with God, we really needed God's power, God's power, God's salvation to come back. So we were made in the image of God. I think I said this last time. We're made in the image of God. We're icons of God. And we never lose that status. Otherwise, we would literally not be human anymore. The problem is when we sinned, we failed to become like God. You know, we, we fail to attain the likeness of God. So we're basically like an image failing to do its job, failing to do its work. Um, it was that, 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 that likeness was destroyed. The image was not. And that was a consequence of sin. And because of our sin, because we're not acting like God or thinking like God, deciding like God, that's the, the, what that causes is the human will uh, to, to be weakened. It causes the, our inclination towards evil to be increased. The, the Latin Catholic tradition calls that concupiscence. We are attracted to things that are spiritually and physically harmful for us. We are attracted towards evil and sin. And sometimes we don't know why. It's just irrational. But it's a consequence of the fall. And we are divided in ourselves. So, you know, we even have you know, the image of the two, the two devils on the shoulder, the one trying to persuade us to do good, the, other, uh, the, the angel persuading us to do good, and the devil on the other shoulder persuading us to do evil. So there's a division going on within us. It's the law of sin operating within us, opposed to the law of God. And God is constantly trying to call us back through our conscience, through his grace, to win us back towards him, uh, whereas we do have that division within us. Now, the human intellect also suffers, see, as, as, as a result of sin. Our intellect is clouded because we have chosen the irrational. Sin and evil are irrational. And we forfeited what is the highest truth, the highest rational thing, which is God and his plan. And our intellect becomes clouded, like willingly going into a dark room and choosing that, no, thinking that, well, we'll be able to see more clearly. And because our intellect is clouded, we're not able to understand our vocation. We're not able to understand our destiny as clearly. We struggle to figure out who we are, what we are, in, in, in view of God, in view of the world. We struggle. We struggle to do that. And so the spiritual death that's going on within us eventually led to bodily death. So it, it, it caused us to die the death to um to help to to it, it it took us away from the journey towards immortality that god had designed for us and what was the first manifestation of uh, our fallenness when we had sinned adam gave excuses he tried to avoid personal responsibility you know, you know the woman made me do it she made me eat of the fruit of the tree that was forbidden so that's oftentimes the first thing that we do whenever we have sinned, whenever we've done something evil, we often try to give excuses and avoid responsibility. However, the good news is that God, uh, while you know, seeing the human person, seeing the human race go through this, does not turn away from us. He has every right to turn away from us and say, you, you people have one chance and, and you blew it. He doesn't turn away from us. He continues to abide with us and gives us hope for salvation. St. Maximus the Confessor even writes that before he even came in the flesh, before he became incarnate, the word of God, the son of God, somehow 
dwelt among the people of the Old Testament in a spiritual manner, preparing them for his coming, preparing them for his coming into the world in the incarnation. God is always leading us to salvation. You know, he created us with a destiny. And when we chose against him, he still calls us forth. He still has a rescue plan. Why? Because he loves us. He loved us enough to make us when he didn't have to. And he loves us enough that when we chose against him, he will fight for us. So the fall of Adam doesn't turn away the love of God for the human person. No, he offers us, he promises us salvation. And he assures us that his plan is more powerful than the fall. His promise is stronger than our weakness. And the fathers of the church will sometimes say that, in fact, because of the fall and because Christ was so powerful, we were able to gain greater things than anything that we had lost through the devil's malice. Christ showed us just how powerful our Lord is, our God is, in view of the devil and in view of evil. Like the devil were to say, I got you now. The Lord comes into the world and says, you think you are so smart. To, you think you were so good to outsmart us back then. I will show you how much greater things I have in store for these people, the human race, whom I made in my image. So what happens is immediately after the fall, God is preparing them for that. God announces to Adam and Eve his promise of salvation. He assures them of his victory, the fact that his victory will not come through their human efforts, even though, yes, they will suffer because of the fall, because they're out of paradise. But it will be, it will come about through the word of God, proclaimed uh, throughout the time of the, the people in preparation for his coming in the world. And that's what the church calls with the phrase, the proto-evangelium if you will, the gospel before the gospel, the first gospel. Now, this is, this is the mystery of our faith. St. Irenaeus of Lyon uh, mystically put it in this way. How will we go, how will we pass into God unless he first passes into us? You know, of course, he's looking at hindsight now. But the great gift of God coming into the world is, 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 is really for one thing to realize his plan from the beginning that we should eventually pass into him. And the Messiah, God's anointed one, is the one through whom the Father will bring us back to him. His new covenant, the new covenant of the son of David, the fulfillment of the people of the old, the, of all of what the prophets spoke about, all of what the people of the Old Testament were expecting, comes in through him comes through the Son of Man, the one that we call the Son of Man, the one that we call the Son of God, to the people of God, the sons of God throughout history, come back to the home of the Father through the Son of God. And as the centuries go along, this promise, the victory of God, becomes clearer and clearer until finally the incarnate word of God makes it absolutely real and victorious. So the expectation of the Messiah will be fulfilled in the person of the Virgin Mary, who said yes to God, through whom God the Son would become incarnate. And this is the great mystery of Mary, the, the mystery of the, this, this young woman who confounds so many Christians uh, and who causes so many Christians to ask, why? Why should I venerate her? Well, because, quite frankly, quite simply, because she is the one through whom God chose to come into the world. God knew what he was doing. He knew that through this, this young woman, he would come into the world, and therefore, we should understand something about him by looking at her, who she was and what she stood for, especially the fact of when she said, yes, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. 
let it be done unto me according to his word. That, that's really the attitude that all of us are called to adopt. That was the attitude that the Eve of old should have adopted, but didn't. And Mary, the new Eve, shows us exactly how we are supposed to live. And so she became the womb, the ark, the temple, the dwelling place of God. She whose womb was more spacious than the heavens, as, as one of our prayers says. The tabernacle of God, through whom, in whom, the word of God, the living word of God, came to dwell in our world, in our created world. The son of God coming in through her. Because of what she did, and because of what, what God did through her, we follow her example and allow our Lord to prepare our hearts worthily to receive the same incarnate God, because we, because we are made in his image, are called to be his tabernacles. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever.